Hello everyone, welcome to this complete walkthrough. In this video, I will share the full methodology that I followed to move from initial discovery to privilege escalation and artifact retrieval in a hands-on lab environment. Please note that I will not reveal any exam answers. Instead, I will describe the exact process, the commands, and the logical reasoning that you can safely practice in your own lab setup. The first step in any engagement is to confirm the scope and then perform basic host discovery. I begin with a simple ping sweep or a tool such as NAP using the command NAP SN subnet. This quickly shows which hosts are alive. Once I identify the active hosts, I run a focused service scan in order to enumerate open ports and service versions. A reliable command for this purpose is NAP SVP IP. This will map all ports and display service banners. When I discover a web interface, I do not rely only on the page source. Many applications today are single-page applications, where the main HTML is empty and the functionality is loaded dynamically. In such cases, I use the developer tools inside the browser. In the Network tab, I monitor the API calls. These API requests often reveal hidden endpoints and parameters that static scanning cannot show. If I observe an endpoint that accepts a URL parameter, I test it carefully to confirm whether it is vulnerable to local file inclusion. For example, I may try curl HTTP, IP port, fetch, URL, equals file, etc., passload, to check if I can read system files. If directory brute forcing is needed, I do not use a very large word list. Many applications return the same error length for missing files. Instead, I select a focused word list with high-value file names such as config, json, nev, settings, xml, or credentials, txt. This makes enumeration faster and more efficient. In cases where the login form is based on JSON, I avoid traditional brute force tools. Instead, I prepare a simple script or loop that posts JSON payloads directly. For example, curl sx, post http, ip, ap, ap, ip, login h, content type, application, json d, username, admin, password, test, and then I check the response for a failure or success message. This technique is lighter and under full control. Once access is gained, I immediately check the system environment. I look inside the home directory of the current user for hidden files, configuration files, or shell history. If I have user-level access, I run sudo l2c, which commands are allowed with elevated privileges. If I see text editors such as vi or less, I know that they can be used to spawn a shell as root. For example, executing sudo slash usr slash bin slash va and then typing. Bash inside the editor is a classic privilege escalation method. It is very important to note the exact binary path displayed by sudo l, because that is what matters. Sometimes the target environment uses containers. On the host, the command docker ps shows running containers and mapped ports. Inside a container, I cannot always run docker. Instead, I check directories such as privar libe, application data. Files like hot, sysjson, or other database files often contain user records, hashed passwords, or stored settings. If I locate a hash, I record it and attempt offline cracking in a safe and permitted environment. If I need to discover listening ports but I do not have NAP, I rely on built-in tools. The commands sstulp or netstat-tulp display listening sockets and associated processes. If those tools are not available, I check environment variables using envgrep and also review configuration files such as package, json or nodeman, json defined port values, to identify a service version without NAP. I can use curl i to read HTTP headers or I can connect with NC or the dev TCP method to capture a banner. It is also important to analyze any monitoring agents or scripts. If I see a file named git, sure a script that calls the metadata address 169.254.169.254, those cinco cuatro. It usually indicates a cloud environment such as age. These scripts may attempt to fetch tokens or region information. That is a valuable clue about possible stored keys. Similarly, if a debug script or docker run command sets environment variables for admin credentials, that information can lead directly to valid access. Throughout the entire process, I keep clear documentation. I copy every command that I run, save important output, and record the exact file paths that contain useful data. If there are differences between local debug containers and production containers, I focus on the production instance because that is where the valid secrets are stored. At the end of the exercise, I review all my steps and prepare a structured report. The report includes the discovery phase, the enumeration results, the method of privilege, escalation, and the location of all collected artifacts. Sensitive details are redacted when presenting publicly, but the methodology remains complete and reproducible. This is the approach that ensures success in any controlled lab. It is not about guesswork or luck. It is about methodical enumeration, targeted testing, privilege escalation through allowed binaries. 
careful container exploration, and disciplined documentation. Thank you for watching this walkthrough. I hope this explanation helps you to understand the logical flow of solving such a challenge. If you found this helpful, make sure to like the video and subscribe for more cybersecurity walkthroughs and learning content.